we use the phrase, uh, do something, do more, do better. Globally, we're concerned in the eastern Mediterranean region, we've got Russia, we've got Somali, um, where they don't have clean water. Do something, get clean water, and you make a big difference. Um, do more, the European um, review, I was talking about Romania, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, and Hungary, doing a lot, but you could do a great deal more. Norway, we've been invited by the Norwegian government to advise them on reducing health inequalities. Norway, Norway's number one in the Human Development Index. Their great life expectancy is relatively narrow inequalities. Norway, why do they need our help? We can learn from Norway. I don't know if Norway can learn from us, but the Prime Minister has asked us for our help. Um, and we're going to give them a report. Uh, I think we're going to have a launch event in February next year. Um, I said in Britain, the health minister and the prime minister have invited me to an event. And people were completely shocked. In Britain, the health minister and the prime minister? No. I said, you're right. No, it's the Norwegian health minister and the prime minister have invited me. So do something, do more, do better. Singapore has done really well. We know that. A bit like I said with Hong Kong. Um, life expectancy, right, yes. So you're doing really well. Um, so my second point, and I've been saying this to my Hong Kong colleagues. Usually we ask the question, why is country X or region Y doing so poor? I've got a different question, and I hinted at it before with my comments about Hong Kong. Why is Hong Kong, South Korea, have to be so quiet in WHO context, Taiwan, um, Singapore, Japan? Why have they done so well? What have they got in common? And I remember going to a Nordic meeting of public health, and the Nordic say, there's no Nordic model. Sweden's different from Denmark. Denmark's different from Norway. In East Asia, you might say there's no East Asian model. Singapore is different from Hong Kong, different from Korea and Japan. From the outside, it's worth asking, what have you got in common? I mean, Hong Kong's got really crowded housing, 30 square meters, subdivided, housing two families in 30 square meters, heat death, they had to go outside to get away from the heat inside. They work long hours, high levels of child poverty. They've got remarkably good health. Hey, this is really interesting. Hong Kong's got a different system to Singapore. And it's different again from Japan and Korea. How come these countries have all done so well? What can we learn? Is it social cohesion? Is it some degree of social solidarity? Is it education? You look at PISA scores, the Program of International Student Assessment. I said that Finland was the best in Europe. China, Macau, Hong Kong, I think Singapore, um, do brilliantly on reading and mathematics comprehension and so on. Uh, so is it education? Uh, but really important question. The third is, and this comes back to the do better, no matter how well Hong Kong or Singapore is doing, there are still inequalities that need to be addressed. And it's not a, enough to say our average is good. We can sit back and rest on our laurels. We've got to deal with the inequalities. And uh, absolutely right. Mental health issues are vital, but inequalities in life expectancy as well. And so, getting a handle on how to take action is of vital importance. But I think the one thing we really want to be proud to say that uh, the inter country inequalities are getting less, but intra country in certain countries are getting worse. 
Is that is that an operation? Yeah, I mean, let's take infants and child mortality by region. Um, if you look at the African region, WHO, it has much higher under five mortality than the other regions. But the improvement over time in absolute levels has been bigger in Africa than in the other regions. So Afro is catching up. That would be really interesting. And I mean, when we began the WHO Commission, we were talking about life expectancy in some sub-Saharan African countries of less than 40. And Japan, you know, for women, 84, 5, 6, whatever it was then, uh, now 86, 7. Um, so we were talking about a 45-year spread in life expectancy. It's less now. Those countries were less than 40 and now more like 50. Now, I mentioned my meeting, second meeting with Manmohan Singh, uh, who was then Prime Minister of India, and he said, what do you want me to do? And I said, in the last 30 years, life expectancy for women in India increased from 50 to 63. 13 years in only 30 years. It's pretty impressive. And I said, life expectancy for women in Japan is now 86. There's no biological reason why women in India shouldn't have the same life expectancy as women in Japan. We've improved 13 years in only 30 years, but we've got a long way to go. And I said, modestly, we think that our commission report tells you what you need to do to get that. So, to some extent, the within country bodies have got small. Uh, mostly countries like Vietnam uh, is astonishing. I mean, in, I'm trying to remember my graph, around 1975, life expectancy in Vietnam was the same as Zambia. Over the period since 1975, life expectancy in Vietnam went like that. In Zambia, with HIV AIDS went down a bit, it's come up a bit. But the gap between Vietnam and Zambia has got enormous. Within countries, where we have the data on adult life expectancy, so within countries, let me distinguish infant and child mortality, where there's been Big examples, I mentioned Sri Lanka before, Brazil is another, where the inequalities in infant and child mortality have got much less. And it's really encouraging. But for adult mortality and life expectancy, firstly, there's a lack of data from most countries in inequalities in adult mortality. And it's a major challenge for countries and I've talked to WHO about this. But those countries where we do have data, whether it's Norway or the UK, Hong Kong, the inequalities seem to be increasing. And I made the point when I was comparing life expectancy by education, that there are huge between country differences, but there are also within country changes over time. And if they can get bigger, they can get smaller. Now we think we have a handle on some of the reasons why they've got bigger. And they're laid out in my reports. Um, but to some extent, they've got worse because the social and economic inequalities have got worse. And then COVID came along. And we said from the beginning, and again, I think I said this in my lecture that you heard yesterday, the pandemic exposed the underlying inequalities in society and amplified them. And we know the inequalities got bigger during the pandemic. And now, many countries of the world 
as suffering a cost of wooden crests, not solely due to the war in Ukraine, um, but because of long term problems, supply chain problems post COVID, the war in Ukraine, gas and electricity uh, prices, but because of long term problems that were building up. And that's leading to real issues. And again, as I think I showed you, in the UK, we've got declining life expectancy in the poorest people. In the US, they've had that for several years pre COVID, declining life expectancy in the poorest people and increase in the richer people. So, huge problems of increasing inequalities within many countries. Can you talk about the 24 Bummer Beacon indicator? Right? Do you, you can give us some ideas what you can share? Well, let me come back a step. Um, about the Marmot Beacon indicators. Again, as I've mentioned, I knock on doors that open and invite me in. And given that we've not been getting much traction at national level in the UK, uh, it's really exciting that Greater Manchester, or first Coventry, became a Marmot city, then Greater Manchester, or be a Marmot city region, population 3 million, 10 local authorities. And that's very exciting. But the question is, is it making any difference? And we think it's very important to be monitoring. So we came up with a raft of indicators that reflect these six domains, as well as disability free life expectancy inequalities and healthy life expectancy. So we want to know about health, but that's a bit sluggish. It moves a bit more slowly. So in working with colleagues in Greater Manchester, we came up with 24 Marmot Beacon indicators, and they relate to these domains. Now, we don't need to do special surveys. That's being assessed at the end of reception week of the first preschool year. Um, 13 measures, cognitive, social, emotional, linguistic, behavioural development, school performance. It's already being assessed and there are various stages through the school where kids do tests and whatever, it's being assessed. So our 24 indicators reflect these six domains as well as health outcomes, inequalities in health outcomes. We were working in a neighbourhood region at Greater Manchester, Cheshire and Merseyside. They developed their own set of indicators at 23. They look similar to the Manchester ones, but slightly different. I mean, I'd like them to be similar so we can monitor around the country, but it's very crucial to know if you're making any difference. So in Coventry, which was the first Marmot city, they did it. We went back and said, have you got any evidence that things are moving in a good direction? Well, this is not a randomized control trial, but the percent of children aged five with a good level of development went up. The proportion of young people aged 18 to 24 not in employment, education, or training, went down. So what happens to school leavers? Do they get further education or training and employment or not? Well, the ones not in employment, education, or training went down. The proportion of people earning a real living wage went up. So there are other measures they've got that suggest things are moving in the right direction. So in Greater Manchester and in the other regions we've been working in, we come up with these beacon indicators that tell you whether things are moving. And you could do that in Singapore. We probably already have many of them. And the more you have, the better. Because it means you don't have to have special efforts to gather data. But then disaggregating them 
by local area, by level of deprivation, is crucial. Yes, uh, uh, for Singapore, I think we have very good uh, data capture. Uh, perhaps one of the challenges is being able to piece together the different data that resides in different ministries and in different sectors. Uh, so one of the work that uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Chan Yo Hui, uh, who is a pediatrician, and she's been working with our Center for Population Health Research and Implementation, is to see how we can piece together the, the school health data that, that really chart the, the child's development throughout the years. And these are really very good data capture on vaccination records, uh, obesity of the children, their school grades, their performance in school, and we can really see how uh, the children progress over the years. Uh, one of the challenges is, of course, getting this data uh, from another statutory board and getting this linked with the health records. And you know, just looking at the six normal principles, this is really multi sectoral work. It goes beyond health, and the social, and the housing, which comes under national development, which a lot of data is captured in schools. The other good data that we would love to have uh, is the social data. Because if there are social challenges, family uh, uh, challenges, these data are often residing in the social service sector. So whether there's been issues of uh, family abuse, uh, various family issues, these are not recorded in our data. We see the impact of it when they present to our emergency department for psychosomatic symptoms or for ab school absenteeism. But we, we probably need to link the different causal factors to what we are observing as health trends. And, and that brings to bear that uh, locally, I think the data we have is very clear. Uh, there's a clear importance of social in terms of health. The older adults that reside in our public rental housing office have poorer health. They are more socially isolated. Their mortality and their life expectancy drops. And even mental health has a huge impact on diabetes. And we have published quite a bit of this uh, based on local data. Uh, but I think what we now need to bring next is to be able to link with school health data, uh, with social sector data. What are the factors that uh, you know, impact or can bend the curve uh, in terms of uh, changing or modifying uh, the start point, which is the housing future for social health data? So, what I'm very interested in is the impact of all these different indicators and how to compound. Or associate the final outcome. Okay, thank you. I think the, the vintage will give us a lot of insights. Right now, we keep, we keep looking at our health data and we're trying to make things better. I think that's not enough. I think Alex, yeah, who's our chief executive for us, Women's and Children's Hospital, probably you have some insights after hearing about all this social problems in health while Sir Michael is talking and reflecting on the work that has been put in. Right, in, in, to, to serve the diverse needs of our younger population. Uh, for example, for the Chronically Ill, you know, we started the Home Care Program uh, that's now in the ministry. We reached out to vulnerable families and then uh, had some interventions. And, and we talked about data. We had some, well, not quite scientific, but uh, rather convincing data that is easily very continuity um, in terms of the growth of this. this uh, uh, and secondly, is in terms of uh, learning disability for those that we have uh, interviewed a few steps. Um, literally, social prescribing and going to prepare rooms using um, the technology apps, the nudges, and all that. So we demonstrated that learning disability, especially in earlier phases, um, that reduced in the patients that we ended up. And as well as uh, in terms of the enhancement of Human potential, right? Uh, our, our team, um, including Yoku, that uh, you know, talked about, uh, been doing a lot of work in the community um, in terms of child development. And, uh, so, so I think there's data, but uh, absolutely right. I think we need to probably need to do more to to have it together. And, and to be fair, I think uh, a lot of this, a lot of these things that I just mentioned, happen uh, out of just pure grit of our staff, as well as the. Uh, um, the goodwill of our community partners and as well as philanthropists. One point to note as well, apart from just physical health, mental health is, is, is a big problem. Um, it comes in many forms, right? Uh, mental health, mental sickness, per se, 
other types of also social semantic uh, uh, semantic symptoms, um, eating disorders, and, and, uh, and so forth. My final comments. Uh, first, I, I agree um, that uh, there's a lot going on, um, but I think that uh, we could do more in terms of the coordination, right? not, not just in terms of data collection. Um, there's a lot of collaboration among all the participants. Two is um, specific to uh, our perspective of the PhD. Uh, I mean, to be fair, the primary care uh, sector has been doing very well uh, in terms of providing um, care for our women and children. But I think this one area that I think we need to work on. And the third is the focus on inequities. I think that will be an interesting one for, for, uh, for us, especially with respect to the, I guess, the resolution of the the variation of interventions of our own approach service. You might have um, the proportional universalism approach. I think that, that would be really interesting because in our work in the uh, incarcerated, uh, parents who are incarcerated as well as certain other communities, we know for a fact that uh, cases or, or adverse childhood experiences, there, there seems to be, we talk about social mobility, there seems to be intergenerational narratives in that respect. So I think it's really very important for all of us to craft an approach that is able to, to repeat this holistically and I guess comprehensively because uh, uh, for me, uh, the zip code would be even more important than the education code. So, so thanks, thanks very much. Eh? Thank you very much for this one. Thanks, Alex. I mean, we really, really need to know this area well because the first time we did on elderly, elderly all the time. Well, to the previous commenter and this one, the conversations I was having with the WHO people, and I mentioned to you earlier, uh, in Cambodia, the Western Pacific Regional Office, and you could say, and it relates to your comment earlier, you know, Singapore and Singapore's fine. Now, what does it need to do any of this stuff? It's all going well, and it doesn't need WHO, it doesn't need to fine. Or you could say what people have been reflecting, we are fine, but we have problems, and we want to address those problems. What I was suggesting to the Western Pacific region was not to convene another commission. We've done one, I did it for Europe. Did it for the Americas, I've done it for North Africa and the Middle East, not to do it again for the Western Pacific, but to try and create a learning network where not to revisit the evidence all over again, but we have big questions, the ones I've referred to. What can we learn from Singapore, from Hong Kong, from Japan, from Korea, from Taiwan, from countries that have done really well, from Vietnam? What did Vietnam do that was so good for its health? We know what happened that was bad for its health. It was a war. Um, but what did it do that was so good? And to come back to the original question, should Singapore be a normal community? And my colleagues say, yeah, of course. And I've mentioned this elsewhere. When Greater Manchester said they wanted to be a normal city region, and I said, my wife has asked, could you please not call it Marmot? She thinks this is egomania, um, <laughs> some kind of narcissism, you know, Trump type narcissism. Could you call it something else? And they said, too late. We talk about implementing Marmot. You know, it's, we've got a Marmot implementation group. And the group, forget the name for the moment, the group includes all the sectors, the social sectors, the police, education, social services, integrated care systems, that all the relevant sectors of the childhood education. And so the idea is Singapore could be a beacon uh, of a community that's doing really well, but wants to do better to address the inequalities persistent mental health problems uh, and the like, and could be a, a beacon for a proposed community 
of countries or of regions within countries that want to pretend Marmot's not me. Don't want to work on Marmot principles, be a Marmot community. I'm very happy for you to call it something else, but really wants to work in this way. And it could be that this is important. Some of the other countries I've just been mentioning could serve similarly as a learning hub to extend the experience. What really works? What can we do better within Singapore? And what can Cambodia and Laos and other countries pick up from? And I've already not been rude, but talked about Australia, the 11 year gap in life expectancy between Indigenous and non Indigenous Australians, and the big inequalities by socioeconomic level within the non Indigenous community. So it's not confined to Indigenous. So all the countries of the region, the rich ones and the not so rich ones, have got something to share here. And Singapore could play the role in that. Uh, I think that's really something that we should build on here. Especially uh, as part of the Singapore Free Development Office of uh, WHO. And I think uh, there are enough talents in this world to do it in this country. Thanks a lot, Sir Mahmoud. I'm Wai right Chong from the Ministry of Health Office for Health Care Coming. So we are thinking about change management, but at the national level, we are still just move a little bit, little bit away from international Singapore being eaten. But how do we start the change process in Singapore? Because we are creating what we call healthy the sink. And we know that uh, at the sink level, we can transform the situation, whether it's the social, it's environment, or physical environment. And that's why we work with the urban redesign, uh, HDB housing development board. But on the social side, we also want to strengthen that we would love to know how individual communities like Coventry, Manchester, as such, when they change, when they apply the principles and they're able to show the measures uh, improvement, were they able to influence other communities? Because in the same way that they mentioned Singapore is a beacon community, we have beacon communities in the East, you know, Cantonese, Bedok, where we are doing amazing things on the ground. And then they could be a beacon where others in Singapore would come and look and see. One of the ideas we're thinking about is beacon healthy for the same, right? Because rather than trying to change the whole country at once, we aim for the politicians with the, both the leverage as well as the interest and passion to do it. And once it's successful, ask others to come and see. Um, and hopefully, then we have created enough tools and frameworks that others can use. So, similar to the Alma Health principles, we can uh, adapt it and or adopt it across different communities around the world. Uh, so we love to hear what our experiences and even beyond today to learn more from you how we can make a community or several communities become the, the, the catalyst for change for the wider countries for the entire country if possible. Because I talked about Coventry a lot, vast numbers of people, politicians, go off to Coventry. They hear me talk about Coventry and we've had politicians say make a beeline to Coventry and they say, what are you doing? We've heard all about it. Tell us about it. Coventry claims, I wouldn't, but Coventry claims they became a European city of culture. They claim because they were a Marmot city. And I said, oh, come on, you, you, you say that to all the boys. Um, I don't believe you. And then, no, no, because Part of our bid to be a European city of culture was that we could say we're investing in early childhood and education and improve communities and so on. So when I went to Manchester and I said, Coventry's doing this, Coventry, who said I don't know Coventry, the whole world has heard of Manchester, you know, <laughs> Manchester United, you know, the, the best Brazilian footballers play in Manchester. If Manchester did it, and they took it on, so they said, okay. And then I went to Liverpool, and everybody knows about Liverpool football. <laughs> I said, do you know what they're doing in Manchester? So Liverpool took it on, Cheshire and Merseyside. Then I went to the north of Dunham, to Newcastle. So there's been a sort of spread, starting with Coventry, saying we're really interested. And it can work like that.
I think Singapore is quite competitive, so I think we get good at the new things. At this juncture, we will just uh, sum up to say what should we do next. Maybe I will invite from each other. How do we continue on this conversation with each other? And then maybe the closing words from us in Michael. My thinking is that, uh, as uh, so Michael says, it is also the marrying both the data, the research part, as well as the action. I think in Singapore, this is where we are very prime to do because we have Capri, which uh, looks at the research side, the Center for Health uh, School, which does the training side. We, and we have the RHS, which is the service side. In fact, we are keen to see how can we have this conversation with our experts and partners from overseas. How can we learn from each other? Uh, what are the new insights? And especially who share with us potential blind spot that we may have. I think today has highlighted a few areas. Uh, it may be not initially a bit painful to swallow, but if it's the truth, it's the truth. I think that that's where we need to start from. And uh, as Michael says, that we can start in various uh, areas. Because Singapore is small, but not that small that uh, we don't have precincts and all those that we need to work with. Because there are, I think, a significant coalition of that are prepared to do this. Now, how do we do this in a measured way, in a way that is coordinated? Because sometimes we may have multiple people with good intentions, good processes, but we get step on each other's feet because uh, we are all working in a very crowded space. So how can we leverage on each other's resources? Because we will never have. So we will be interested to learn from the experiences in other places. But at the same time, we are most welcome to our guests, even local and overseas, to also journey with us to give us your insights, the goods, that what we have done well and not done so well. But sometimes it's true when we are doing the work, we tend sometimes to focus on what we have not done well. It's always how can we do better, which is what King Hawk says we are very competitive. But we sometimes forget to reflect what we have done well and therefore don't feel so much on the strength. So the staff keep feeling we are working so hard and yet my boss keeps telling me do more, do more. <laughs> so, so how do we manage that part? So, so I thought that that call to action, marrying the various resources that we have. Uh, I can't speak for the rest of people, but at least for Singapore. But I think if we get this moving on our side, it will have positive benefits. And perhaps we can bring the other parts of Singapore in because we also have uh, partners from MOTH. And the various agencies who are here just receive the WhatsApp so that they're happy to work with us. So I think that's something that I look forward to. So, and we look forward to all everyone coming back. First thing to say is if you really, you, whoever you is, that the various actors in Singapore really want to do this, we're happy to work with you. We've been working with Coventry and Manchester, and we'd be very happy to work with you. The second thing, and it relates very much to what you said, we're on the same page here. Uh, often I get asked, well, how do you get political change? And I say, I haven't a clue. I know people who think about that they know how to do it, but I don't know. I know what I do, which is tell the truth, argue from the evidence, so it's exactly what you've just been saying, and engage people in the broader issue of social justice. That's why we're doing what we're doing. And your point, which I agree with completely, is don't only focus on what we're doing badly, but focus on what we're doing well as well, not in the spirit of self-congratulation, but that's what motivates people. That's what gets them out of bed in the morning. Hey, look, we're making progress and we're doing it for the right reasons. We're not doing it to make money, we're not doing it just because it's you know, the job, but we're doing it because it's the right thing to do in the spirit of social justice. When I began the WHO Commission, I told myself that I had to read Don Quixote in the English translation, uh, a medieval. Uh, 
man imagines himself to be a medieval knight running around doing chivalrous deeds and everyone's laughing. I said, that's me. <laughs> and running around trying to change the world uh, and everyone's laughing at me. And I said this to the Spanish Minister of Health and he said, ah, we need Don Quixote, the dreamer, but we need the pragmatism of Sancho Panza. So we need to dream, but we need to take the tangible, concrete steps to achieve that dream. And let's start with a country that we know can do it, Singapore, because you're doing so well that you could do even better. And let's see if we can't spread that dream to other parts of this region of the world. We should conclude for the time being, and uh, I'm sure there's a part two to this coming up. So uh, thank you, Sir Michael, and thank you all.